Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Manscaped has the revolutionary electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it's guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts or your chest because you can use it upstairs and downstairs. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have adult actress, porn star, and all around fucking badass Carter Cruz on. Carter, how are you? I'm doing fucking great, considering I haven't left my house in four months. So, <laughs> so how seriously are you taking quarantine? Have you really like? Have you gone to the grocery store at all? Are you ordering everything? Uh, I've gone to the grocery store mainly because there was no ordering available. I always order my groceries, but all that stuff was like, especially in the beginning, you couldn't. Yeah. Like, no, you couldn't. Was, yeah, I was like, oh, you want your groceries in like three weeks? <laughs> like, I need to eat before that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but we've been taking it pretty seriously. Uh, we have someone in my house who's high risk. So it's, we're taking it much more seriously than a lot of my friends, uh, which has kind of been interesting because. But I think the majority of the people that I hang out with are taking it relatively seriously. If they are going out and seeing some people, they're getting tested uh, regularly. So, but it's just been, it's been weird. I mean, I travel all the time and I'm constantly meeting new people. And the last four months, I've only left my house to go to the grocery store, like maybe a CVS run, (laughs) Um, go on a walk. That's pretty much the only thing I've done. I did record um a virtual dj set for a festival and i went somewhere for that it was outside but i immediately felt there was probably 10 people there and it was outside and i just instantly felt so anxious like you know Mm -hmm. i was like oh my god like everyone's wearing masks and everything but i was just like oh like can you stand (laughs) over there yeah you know yeah yeah Because, I mean, I don't think I would necessarily die if I got COVID, but I don't want to spend two weeks in a hospital on a ventilator, and I feel like there's not enough evidence that that wouldn't happen to me, and I just would rather not risk it. (laughs) It's such, I mean, it's it's such a strange disease because it affects everybody so differently. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, now they're starting to see, like, even if you weren't, seriously ill complications that last well past the time right. you've recovered. Um, like for example, my mother-in-law got it and she's a nurse. And so they test regularly and she had COVID patients in her ward and she found out that she had it. She never had a single symptom ever. She was fully asymptomatic, fully asymptomatic, yeah. quarantined anyways. Um, and she didn't give it to anybody in her house, thankfully. But yeah, and then I have another friend whose mom is dying from it. She's had two strokes from it, and she was in, you know, these are both, both these women are around the same age, both in relatively like the same health and completely different effects. Yeah, it's really different. My uh, my roommate was just telling me, like, right before we jumped on here, that I guess basically there's so many factors. Like, one thing is that, you know, the flu and viruses that are similar. Basically, like when you get those things, they build up antibodies in your system. Mm -hmm. So like based on the area you live in, what kind of things you've been exposed to, that's one of the things that can really influence how bad it affects you. And you really don't know until you get it. You know, there's no like, oh, well, because you might have had a strain of flu or something that was like similar enough, I guess, that you know, now your body is a little stronger to fight against it, but there's no way of knowing that until you mm-hmm. get it. And, uh, yeah, I just, yeah, it's, uh, it's really scary and, um, we know so little about it. And yeah, I know actually, I have some friends. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, I, I did, um, I did an interview for KCRW a couple of days ago, which I was Ooh. excited about. Yeah, I know it's so <laughs> funny because like all of my more, um, I don't want to say intellectual friends, but 
I don't know, maybe people who are more happen to listen to KCRW and NPR as opposed to, I don't know, K Rock. Um, <laughs> they were really excited. And I like posted it on Twitter because I was like, oh, this is so exciting. And like, no one cared. I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> I didn't see it. I would have cared. It's okay. It's all right. Porn, porn Twitter doesn't care about me being on KCRW. It's fine. <laughs> I care. That's all that matters. Uh, but they asked me, they, they had me and my mom on, and what they wanted to do was talk about the difference between like the AIDS pandemic when that broke out right. and, and this pandemic. Well, I guess the AIDS wasn't really a pandemic, but you know, the AIDS outbreak, I mean, and right. how scary that was and how that affected the adult industry. And then um, the coronavirus pandemic and how that's affecting the adult industry. And it was really interesting to kind of talk about how, like in those early days, you know, this one big similarity is that we knew so little about the disease. Right. You know, because at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, they thought that like you could like get it from kissing and, you know, people were <laughs> touch other people with HIV. And obviously now we know that's not the case. And now even if you get it, though, obviously nobody wants it. Like you can still, you know, take medication and live a long life. Right. But so it's just like, it's just that, that scary uncertainty and unknowing of how, you know, you are going to be able to manage a disease. And this one's even worse because it's transmittable via the air, you know, right. and that's like yeah. what's so terrifying. It's much more easy to catch. Yeah. Like, like yeah. HIV is pretty, you know, difficult. Like you could have sex with someone with HIV and not get it, you know? So it's right. like, there's a lot less likelihood. And then I know like with COVID, I've seen like some people who are like, I have been wearing a mask everywhere. I've only seen four people and I got it. And it's like, yeah. that's crazy. Like, you know, so it's like, it, and you, you feel a little bit crazy, you know, just like at the beginning, I was like, we go to the grocery store and I would wash everything. You know, I had these little Clorox wipes. I would wipe down all the packaging. I washed all everything, you know, just that I could. And, you know, it was constantly like anytime someone got food delivery or something, I was wiping down yeah. the outside of the packaging, like disposing of it. And it was like, this is like a lot, you know? And then I think that I, I, there was kind of some evidence that maybe touching things isn't as common of passing as actually someone breathing on you. So right. I kind of relaxed that a little bit, you know, I still certain things I'm like a little bit more mm -hmm. careful about, but it's just weird because, and you have so many people that are just responding to it differently. Like I have some friends that are literally flying places they're going to parties they're, they're living their normal life and then mine has been completely different so it's just very odd because I think no one knows what to do and I think for me I just rather err on the side of caution and I'm lucky enough that I like I can do that I feel like some people absolutely can't and I mean if I was living alone oh my god like two years ago I was living alone in my place in Hollywood which I loved cute little place but had no AC. I had those like window AC units and I travel a lot. So it's fine. You know, you're not really there too much. But I was just thinking the other day, like if I had been trapped in that apartment by myself, like I'd be losing my mind and I'd be like, I don't care. Like I'm going to go out into the world. I have to, but I'm in a really good situation now. I have, you know, four roommates and we have a pool we're in the suburbs. We have a grocery store in walking distance. You know, it's like you can walk outside. There's not a ton of people out there. And we have our whole little pool and everything. And I have friends and I have a few friends that get tested so they can like come over. Um, so, you know, we're in, I'm in a really good situation and I'm very, very grateful for that. So I like definitely do not judge the people who are stuck in like a one bedroom apartment going out because I would be doing the same thing. You know? Yeah. It would be interesting to see. I, I, I feel like eventually after everybody, everybody keeps saying like, once this is over and there's a part of me that's like, is this ever going to be over? Yeah. Do you remember when it first started? I was, my, my husband was like, this is going to go through the summer. And I was like, no, it's not. Like, <laughs> there's no way that we're going to be quarantined for more than a month. That's insane. You can't shut down the economy for six months. Like people have to go <laughs> oh, work. stupid. And now it's like mid July and I still <laughs> like haven't really worked. And I'm like, 
<laughs> yeah, I know. My my boyfriend said this is going to last to the end of the year, at least. You know, now he's like, I think this is going to go into 2021. I'm like, Jesus, like, oh yeah. my God. I don't know, like, I'm going to freaking die. <laughs> so far, I'm doing much better than I thought. Like, if you told me, you know, last year that this was going to happen, I would tell you there's no way I could do it. I will lose my mind. I can't do it. And it's actually been kind of nice. I mean, I don't want to say, you know, that this time has been a blessing or anything because obviously a lot of people are in these terrible situations and it's been god awful for a lot of people. I mean, it has been for me financially, but I'm just in a lucky spot where like my boyfriend isn't going to kick me out of the house. You know, so I'm not going to be homeless and if I wasn't in a situation where I lived with a bunch of people who love me and, you know, a lot of them are still working, then it could be a bad situation. So obviously, overall, it's been terrible for, you know, the country and for the world. But for me, having this good situation, I've been trying to take advantage of it. You know, I don't want to look back on this year and be like, I could have done so much more with this time. And I didn't. I just sat around and complained about it. And that's what I've been trying to not do. And basically, wake up every day, have a good routine, exercise, eat healthy, you know, been cooking a lot and do all knock out all these things adult things like getting my finances together like dealing with some tax stuff that I always want to put off and so that at least at the end of this year which we hope that it won't be longer than like into a little bit of next year um, at least I can look back and be like you know I'm proud of how I spent my time even if it wasn't the best year of my life I didn't maybe do anything amazing but I want to look back and be proud of myself for how I spent the time with what I was given. Yeah. Being productive. Yeah. I think what this whole quarantine thing has kind of made me realize is how busy we make ourselves and how hectic Mm -hmm. our lives are on a regular basis and just the insanity with which we work and that kind of culture around the got to build my career, constantly go, 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 never take time off. This is kind of forced a lot of people to take time off or to step back and get, you know, all the other things together that they weren't able to before because they were always, you know, trying to climb that ladder. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's, it's, it's shown, it's, it's, sh- it's also shown like the holes in our society and in our government and in our healthcare. And so a part of me really hopes that this will in a way, like actually make us better. Right. You know, I feel like, yeah, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people are like saying I'm so bored, you know, but I feel like I've been almost busier than ever because like usually, you know, I travel on the weekends, I'm working and my days that I work are long. Like I might fly across the country. I play a show I don't even sleep and I fly to the next city, I play a show, and then I fly back to LA. So when I get back on Sunday night, I feel totally cool taking Monday and Tuesday to just be a piece of shit because I earned money, right? So I'm like, okay, I busted my ass all weekend. I'm going to sleep all day Monday. And then Tuesday, you know, I'll like do my nails or like a hair mask, you know, all those things kind of self-care. And I'll just like two days of the week, I like, I'm just completely not doing anything because I mean, doing things maybe, but I don't know if watching Netflix like (laughs) counts Mm -hmm. as anything, but because I'm not earning any money, it's like this even more pressure to create content, to get things done that I normally don't have time for because it's like, bitch, like you didn't make any money the last three months. Like you need to be building. Whereas before it was really easy for me to say, oh, well, I made this much money this weekend. Like I'm just going to sit on the couch and watch TV. So mm-hmm. for me, it's been kind of like an opposite thing where I feel like I'm even more hectic and like all over the place. Like I need to do this. I need to do this because I know I have the time and I feel guilty not using it, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think the pre- – the pressure to hustle is definitely um, increased tenfold. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have to find alternate means of making money. I mean, a majority of my income was from shooting for clients, and right. that obviously has pretty much stopped. So, 
I've had to really focus on this podcast and, and other means of income. Is that so good though? Because yeah. you're like excited to like focus on the podcast, you know? And yeah, no, actually it's been really great. It's been, I've been able to like focus more on marketing. We finally got to change my logo, which I wanted to do for a long time. Um, I'm actually working on, I just had a meeting with uh, my brother-in-law today because he's going to help me do research, but uh, I'm going to do like a historical uh, version of the podcast on um, the legalization of porn in California, like through the Freeman case and like why porn is like California's epicenter of porn and I started in New York and moved over here and like different between porn in Florida and California. So it'll be more, it won't be me necessarily like interviewing one person. It'll be me narrating this kind of like a hardcore history on porn. Right, right, sort of. right. I love that. Yeah. So I'm excited to like try something different. All right. We're going to take a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back. We're going to talk more about the adult industry, about her DJing career. So stick around. Summer is here and Manscaped is here to help you level up your full body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it is guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts. And if you want to use it on your chest hair, it actually has different settings so you can get the perfect length, whether or not you're the kind of guy who likes to be a little bearish or maybe actually wants a bare chest, literally. You can get all of this inside the perfect package where you will find the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, as well as the crop reviver, a testy toner that is designed to give you a pep in your step. If you subscribe to the perfect package, you will get a blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. So what are you waiting for? Make this your best and most hairless summer ever. Go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, we are back. So we were talking about how you're making extra money during the, um, during the pandemic. Now, what a lot of people have been talking about and a lot of people who aren't in the adult industry have been doing is like jumping on the OnlyFans train mm-hmm. because everybody thinks that that's this really easy and quick way to make money. So that brings my question to you. Are you doing any kind of sex work at all anymore or have you left that all behind? Uh, I mean, I haven't shot in like over a year but I mean I'm not like oh I can never do that ever again right, right. or anything so I hate when people are like oh did you retire I'm like I mean I don't know like I, I don't really shoot anymore but um but as far as the OnlyFans stuff you know it's one reason why I kind of like phased out of the industry was just how it was changing and not that I dislike it I actually think it's amazing like the OnlyFans stuff and it's putting 
the power back in the hands of the performers, right? So you can be making a ton of money off OnlyFans and, you know, kind of then you don't have to work for a company that you don't have to work for. You know, I was kind of, I came into the industry before all that and kind of started phasing out right when that stuff with Snapchats and everything were getting popular. That's kind of when I was like slowly exiting the industry. So it was kind of like the last phase of like the older industry. And I think it's really, really great because, you know, I know situations where like maybe you don't really want to shoot for this company or you don't want to shoot with this person, but you need the money and so you have to do it. And I think it's amazing that this OnlyFans stuff is putting the power back in the hands of the performers. I think it's great. Um, It's just not personally, like it doesn't appeal to me. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of like a tomboy. Like when I did porn, I was in college um, when I started and everyone was like what the fuck (laughs) you know because like that was just not me like I don't know I'm like I like to wear big t-shirts I don't wear a lot of makeup um you know I'm just kind of like a tomboy and I'm definitely a very sexual person and always have been um I love having sex and I just like love I think sex is great and I have very sex positive but I'm just not into the whole like teasing thing you know what I'm saying like and Mm -hmm. so porn for me was really fun because I love to act I've been doing it my whole life it's like my favorite thing to do so going to a porn set for me was like it was acting right you go and you get to pretend to be someone else for the day and then you and then you and you get to have sex and a lot of times it's really great and fun and pleasurable not always but (laughs) a lot of times So, you know, that was what I loved about it. And the whole OnlyFans stuff is just not up my alley. You know, it's being at home. It's getting all dolled up at your house and kind of like teasing guys, like talking with them. And, you know, like a virtual strip club. Right, exactly. And that's just never really been something I enjoy. You know, I think it's amazing that girls have that and, and, and and the guys as well. But it's just not... I think I would feel ridiculous, you know, I, especially I've always really tried to separate um, from the beginning of me doing porn myself as a person and this person that I play on camera. You know, I think a lot of girls, when they create their porn persona, whatever name they give themselves, that's, that's their porn persona, right? And then they go home and their, their legal name and that's their like at home persona. But for me, uh, you know, I always knew I wanted to do other things besides porn. And so when I created Carter Cruz, like this brand, it was supposed to basically carry me through other industries. And so I've always tried to make it like Carter Cruz isn't a porn star. I mean, yeah, she is, but she's also other things. But Carter Cruz isn't my on-screen personality. It's me, you know, and the on-screen porn personality is something separate from that like part of it but not the whole thing Mm so it just always feels weird to me to basically through my own name as Carter Cruz that like everyone calls me like even my parents (laughs) call me (laughs) to be like you know all like flirty and stuff with people because I'm like this this isn't me you know this would be someone else so when I'm going to a set and I'm like getting paid to play a character it's like okay this is acting but if I'm at home being myself then suddenly I feel like this isn't make sense I I hear you (laughs) it's harder for you to separate yeah your porn persona from like you as a person like you want to going to set and having the production having the hair and makeup having the cameras and the lighting and like having it be a whole thing right it's totally an entirely different experience than just like masturbating in your own home or yeah, like, doing I mean, videos where you sit on cakes and, you know. <laughs> and I love that shit. I think it's great. Like, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm fired up for all my friends who are making yeah. bank on OnlyFans. But I'm like, I think I saw the industry kind of trending towards that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, this this isn't what I want to do, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I was never planning on being in the industry for a very long time. But it definitely was kind of like, okay, this is like my kind of my cue to start phasing out because the girls who are really successful and making the best money right now are doing those things. And it's silly to be in the industry and not do that. And mm-hmm. I just thought, you know, I, I felt like it would leave like a bad taste in my mouth. And 
you know, I've seen so many girls who have been in the industry um, that, you know, they leave and then they kind of have this like really negative view of the industry. And I never, I don't want to ever be like that because Mm. I'm very proud of my work in adult. I have no shame over it. I think it's fucking awesome. I love all the people that I met, um, all the friends I've made. I'm still friends with them. And I want, you know, to keep that positive view of it, which can be hard, especially when you try to transition into other things. And, you know, because you suddenly realize, oh, we have the stigma, I'm going to face it every day. And so people kind of turn this like, have this negative feeling about it. And I was like, you know, if I force myself to basically create this content that I don't enjoy, and that I don't love, while I'm also continuing to face the stigma as I try to transition into other industries, I feel like I could develop a really like strong like feeling towards the industry of like resentment. And that's not what I want because I don't feel that way. And I, but I feel like forcing myself, you know, the reason why I did porn was because I didn't want to do something I didn't want to do. You know, like Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I I want to live life on my own terms and I want to do things that make me happy. I don't want to go to an office and sit there nine to five. I didn't want to do any of those things. And that's why I decided to do porn. So forcing myself to start an OnlyFans, you know, people always tell me you can make so much money and like, you're probably right. But I just feel like filming myself masturbate and doing stuff that I don't enjoy doing. I think that I would develop a lot of resentment um, towards the industry because that's not why I got into porn to begin with. So, you know, I just kind of felt like this isn't really my vibe. I'm going to make a little uh, exit from the industry, but I'm definitely not against like I just got hit up to do, I'm going to be a voice in a hentai porn. Yeah, I love hentai. I'm not a big porn watcher. I literally had never watched porn um, my whole life until right before I got into porn. Mainly because like we had a family computer and I was just terrified that like my parents would know that I look stuff up and I was very interested in sex from a really early age you know so I definitely like I would go to Barnes Noble and I'd go to the you know the sex section and I would read a lot of books so I was pretty like precocious um as far as sexuality as a child but as far as porn never ever watched it and I I think it kind of gives me a very interesting perspective on sex compared to most people because I think a lot of people, their first exposure to sex is through porn. And like when I lost my virginity, I had never seen a a porno. And I think that's different from most people because most people before, long before they ever have sex, they've watched porn. So they, that's what they think of sex, you know, and my introduction into sex was purely like very innocent I guess I mean like I don't know if we can call it innocent <laughs> if it's sex but just like I had no preconceived notions I had no idea of what sex was supposed to be like or what like you know I just didn't know any of that I just like went into it with like just myself and I'm very very grateful for that and I, I wish more people could have that experience but as a result um, you know because I watched porn really right before I got into the industry. Like I was already thinking of doing porn and then I was like, mm, maybe I should like watch a porno. <laughs> I know what. Maybe you should do some research. Which is saying right. a yeah. Before do. I do this life changing yeah. thing, I should watch this. So I did that and I watched a few pornos. And of course the ones I watched were like, you know, I thought all porn was like that. It was super artsy. It was like portrait of a call girl. And it was like a movie. And I was like, Oh wow. <laughs> like, this oh is wow. So- yeah. I feel like, the opposite is the true for most people. Most people like go on Pornhub and they see like, I fuck my stepsister or like, you know, I put my balls in my stepmom's mouth. Right. <laughs> and they think like all porn is like that. Right. And exactly. what I'm always trying to explain to people is that porn is not one thing. Porn is so many so different many things. things. Yeah. There's so and- many different kinds of porn. Like you can find whatever you're into, like you can find it. Find so it. I'm into so it's interesting it. that you had a different – Totally different. And I think it's partially because I looked for that, you know, like I had like, those are the, also like the girls who are in those types of things. Like that's who I read about that like piqued my interest in doing porn Mm -hmm. where I was like, oh, these girls have dope lives. Like they get to do whatever they want 
I can you give me that. an example of like who like just, Sasha Gray, who? like Jesse Andrews, okay. like we're like two that really like, you know, I saw that they went on and did all this other cool stuff. And yeah. I was like, that's dope. Like they literally did porn and then they got to do all these other things and like they got to build this brand using porn and you know so I had read some interviews with them basically you know just like on Vice read some interviews and I was like wow like their life seems so cool and then kind of started looking more into the industry and like reading more like articles and interviews with porn stars and that's kind of like what got me interested in it before I even knew what shooting a porn entailed you know and then, of course, I looked into, um, you know, those movies, like, I love, like, Wasteland, like, Elegant Angel did it a few, like, years before I got into the industry. Like, I think it's just a fantastic um, movie. Yeah, the tra- you know, it's funny that you say that, because I remember watching the trailer <sighs> and being like, this looks fucking amazing. And then I bought the DVD, and I've never watched you it. you never watched it? <laughs> oh, my God. Closet. And I don't even have a DVD player anymore. Oh my god! Yeah, you gotta. Oh, the yeah, trailer you was amazing. The trailer was so good. Yeah, I've watched it a few times. It's really cool what they did there, and it's kind of the porn that I like. Is that they basically filmed full sex scenes, but then during the movie they're cut down to maybe five minute scenes. So when you get the DVD, you can go watch the full sex scene as an extra. But when you're watching the movie, you know a lot of pornos are like. 10 minutes of dialogue, 10 minutes of sex, 10 minutes of, you know what I'm saying? This formula. I'm like, I really don't want to watch like four 10 minute sex scenes in a movie. Like, what am I going to do with that? You know, I would like a more slow burn. Like, so by the end of the movie, you're like, I'm so fucking turned on because you've seen all these little like pieces of, and then it kind of culminates like the last scene is a little bit more full and it's, you know, I don't know. So the whole movie is more kind of teasing you and then you get to this like final thing. So the movie is something to be watched in one sitting as opposed to let me watch this dialogue with this scene one day and you know, kind of thing. And that's really that's yeah. really interesting. And actually I like that idea because and I think you can only do that with a movie where the non sex parts are actually so good that you would watch them on their own. Because most right. people fast forward through that part, get to the sex you know, and they ignore the rest of it. But I like that formula. Yeah, no, it's great. And and the thing is, they're still getting what they paid for. If you want to watch the full scene, you can go see it. So yeah, it's just like not forced on you to like, sit. I don't like if I'm watching a movie, I don't want to multiple times sit through that long of sex. Like, you know, I just want a little sexiness in it. Oh, like there's a scene. I think it's with Manuel and, and Lily Carter, I think. And she's like, Oh, no, Lily LeBeau and Manuel, I think, and Lily Carter's in the bathroom stall. They're, like, at a club together. And so Lily LeBeau and and Manuel are basically – she goes in the bathroom to fuck him. And so they're, like, fucking in the, in the bathroom, like, stall. And Lily Carter is, like, in the bathroom stall next to them, but they don't know. And so she's, like, listening to them fuck, and she's, like, getting all turned on and stuff. But just the way it's shot – like, there's so many ways that could be, like, cheesy as fuck, and it's just – so hot that like you yeah. know they're just having dirty sex in this public restroom and like this girl that has a crush on this other girl is like next to it and she's like it's just really really hot and right. a lot of porn doesn't really do it for me like that and so as a result especially like once I got started watching porn I mean I was in the industry and so as a result a lot of people um, that I really like as performers are my friends and so it kind of kills the vibe a little bit you know what I'm saying it's like you're watching it you're just like it's so weird like we kick it and like it's just not as hot so I think as a result that's why I got really into I love the animated stuff um that's where my train of thought was going that I lost but um as far as the animated stuff like the anime stuff because it's not anyone I know it's purely fantasy and they also have like really good storylines in a lot of those, you know, like where I'm actually like, ooh, what's gonna happen? <laughs> you yeah. know, and so it's a little, it's a little less like formulaic, little bit of dialogue, 20 minutes of sex or whatever. And it's a little bit more kind of spread throughout the movie and everything like that. So I really got into I love the hentai stuff. And so I as soon as I found out that there was a company in California that was wanting to do that I was like oh my god please consider me and I was like two years ago and they just hit me up and we're like we're gonna make it so 
do you want to be a voice? And I was like, oh, it's so cool because, like, I don't have to be naked or, like, get fucked, but, like, I still get to make this, like, cool product Yeah, I like, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm with you. I – I, I never watch porn, but if I do, I it has to be people I don't know. And yeah. it has to be um and a lot of times it's like hentai porn because of that. And it's funny because sometimes like if I watch a scene and I know someone in it, I'm like, I can't I can't. And sometimes I'll watch a scene and like the guy they'll purposely cut the guy's head off and I'll be like, Okay, this is hot. And then like I hear his voice yeah. and I can't <laughs> know who it is, and I'm like, Nope, I'm done. Really I'm done. I can't. I know who you are now. Like, it ruins it. You know too much about yeah. them. You're like, oh my god, yeah. I know your kids. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just like you can't. It's like I can't objectify you now. Thanks yeah. a lot. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah, and I think also too, I, when I would try, to, I watched some scenes like to prepare for like certain companies. You know, when I before I worked for a company, I'd be like, okay, let me watch some of their porn. And you notice that you know when you're working with these guys, they have their like things that they always say to girls. And it's the more you watch it, it's harder to separate yourself when you're actually performing in the scene. You know, obviously, you know that at the end of the day, you're going to be like, bye, and then like not talk to them until you work with them again, you know? But right. during the scene, you obviously have to kind of create this fantasy of like, you're really fucking into them. And the easier it is to believe that, like the better the scene it's going to be, right? Right. And so I think that, you know, certain guys are really good at like dirty talking and they say these things that are really hot. But then if you watch a porno and you're like, oh, like he says this to every girl. <laughs> 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 the yeah. The next time you're working with him and he says that, you're like, bitch, like shut up. Yeah. Like, oh, he's the most beautiful girl in the world. You're like, yeah. <laughs> You just said that to Angela White yesterday. Yeah, okay. like I heard that shit. Thanks like I don't want it. <laughs> yeah. So oh, that's really. why I always kind of like avoided watching it because I was like, Ugh, I don't want to see these same people fuck other people because I want it to feel special with me. So that right. even though you know it's not special, yeah. obviously it's work, but you know, you want to be able to feel like that so you can like really enjoy it and make a good scene, you know, because right. chemistry is everything. Yeah, 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 totally. So earlier you were talking about how you weren't doing, you know, the OnlyFans and all that kind of stuff because you didn't want to feel, ever feel like any kind of resentment towards working an adult, which you had not experienced, even though you're not really working anymore. So that brings me to the question of, you know, something that's been a hot topic lately with Mia Khalifa coming out, talking about her experience in the adult industry. And I thought that you said some really poignant things on Twitter about it. And I know a lot of people in the industry are really on fire about it. So what is your opinion on that whole thing? You know, I mean, I think it's like really sad because I don't know, I have a lot of empathy for these people because Mia is not the first one um you know I think yeah before that there were, there's always someone who gets a whole lot of mainstream attention for basically saying like how bad of experience they had in porn you know god forbid they put the spotlight on someone who loves their job right um, that doesn't sell as well yeah it does not and yeah. so because and people I, want something that pushes the narrative that they've always they, they've right. been fed their whole lives that porn is evil. So like right. they want something that, that reinstitutes their belief in that. Right. And that's, yeah, exactly. That reinforces their narrative. And like, for instance, I know like the Hot Girls Wanted like movie that came out like a few, like, I don't know, like five years ago or whatever. Um, really interesting because uh, that was being shot right when I first got into the business. And initially uh, Dakota Sky and I were supposed to be like, the girls in that documentary and it's just interesting to think how differently that would have turned out um if they had gone with us but at that point I'd probably been in the business two months I was like still shooting in Florida I hadn't come out to LA yet um but basically you know there was this new agency that I just started in Florida and that's very skeevy and they know I think this about them <laughs> And, you know, I mean, I went to the model house and it's just like, it looked like a crack den. There's like mattresses on the floor. Like he was sleeping with the girls. He was like, there were models for him. You know, it was just all around like gross. And they were like, oh, perfect for our documentary about the porn industry. 
because it's the worst thing that exists. You know, can I, I tell you something really funny just what? real quick before yeah. I forget? Because we're talking about the very first Hot Girls Wanted. Yeah. And like that was the, the anthology that I was part of. And it was on the basically on the adult industry on the East Coast, and they mm-hmm. followed a certain agent. And so I ended up like, you know, talking, knowing, getting to the the producers because of my segment that I ended up doing a couple of years later. And one of the producers told me that she got pink eye from that house. Oh my God. Just from being there producing Jesus. I was like, I really believe it. I went there. It was when I was first getting into the business and I was like the guy who runs that house. Like I, I won't even mention him by name, but you know, I've literally two months in the industry, like I was at some like party with him and he's like, Carter, I feel like you don't like me. And I'm like, I really fucking don't like you're gross. Like you fuck the girls who work for you, like completely unprofessional. And you literally have like a model house that you think is like so cool. And it's like girls sleeping on a fucking like shitty mattress on the floor. Like it's disgusting. You know, I could tell I was like, you're in this for like your own personal gain, like to basically have hot, young, impressionable women around you that you can manipulate into fucking you. And I do not agree with that, you know? So that was, I clearly, I know why they picked that. Like they wanted that story. And those girls that were the main girls in that, like when I first moved to California or wasn't moving out here, but I was coming out here to work, those girls and I, like we were tight. Like we would stay in hotels together you know so I kind of saw that whole story unfold from like my perspective and then when I watched Mm -hmm. the the documentary it was like wow this is like not what I saw you know um so clearly they're always going for those like types of stories that's what they want Mm -hmm. to push and um so as a result every few years there's someone who makes a lot of mainstream press they complain about porn it's so awful everyone can go we always knew porn was evil, sex work is terrible, it's exploitive, and and then society goes on feeling good about stigmatizing sex, sex workers, and sex workers get pushed farther into their own little world. Um, so, you know, but at the same time, I do think there are stories of girls being highly taken advantage of, of being used, of being manipulated. I think some girls get into the business way too young, and I don't think that they have any idea of what they're getting into. I was 22 when I got into porn. I researched it like crazy on the internet. Like I knew I was going to be a Spiegler girl. Like you know, I was like, okay, this guy is legit. He represents all these girls like that, like love him. Like that's you know who I want to kind of. So I had kind of this idea of the industry going in. I knew how to navigate it. And I was much older and more comfortable with myself and more confident. Um, But, you know, a lot of girls get in at 18 and they are impressionable. They're easy to manipulate and bad things do happen as they do in every industry. Um, But unfortunately, those girls' voices are amplified so much they drown out everyone who had a good experience. But I also always have this like kind of like wrestle inside me because I do have empathy for their situation. I mean, I've had bad things happen to me both in the porn industry and doing mainstream stuff. I've experienced terrible things. And so, you know, I do have empathy for them. And I always feel bad because it's like your story is valid, you know, and I think they have every right to talk about this person took advantage of me, this person manipulated me you know, whatever, this person assaulted me, whatever it was. And there's nothing wrong with them sharing those stories. But I think the problem is, is that because the media latches onto those and only shares those stories and just kind of skates over everybody else who's been in the industry 20 years and loves it. um, As a result, the industry gets a lot of resentment. And something I learned while being in the industry was like, you know, it's a very tight knit group and people are like family. I think a lot of people date in the industry. A lot of their, maybe most of their friends are in the industry. You go to work, obviously, in the industry. So as a result, and when you go outside of that, you're either like a freak on display of like, oh, wow, look at this porn star. Or you're like, ew, like this dirty whore, you know? So you feel most at home with people who are in the industry. And as a result, it's kind of this very tight knit thing. So when someone comes out and says, I had this bad experience, you know, the industry is very resistant to that. They, Mm -hmm. you know, are like, fuck you, you know, because you're pushing the stigma. 
But then it's also hard because I'm like, and I, I empathize with that because I'm like, you are, you're pushing the stigma. You're feeding into this mainstream narrative that society wants us to believe that sex work is inherently exploitive. And it's not. I mean, sex work is really like any other job. You know, it can be exploitive. You can be manipulated. You can do things you don't want to do. You know, of course that stuff can happen. It can happen in any aspect of your life. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter what it is. And the main reason that happens like to sex workers a lot of times is because they have no recourse. You have no way, you know, if you're if you're an escort and you get raped on a job and you go to the police, they're going to arrest you for escorting, right? So this stigma that we have around sex workers causes the industry to be very closed off You know, they are not open to criticism, which can be bad. I think sometimes people come forward with good stories that we should learn from and be like, yeah, you're right. That company is shitty and we need to get rid of them. But people immediately close off. They close ranks. They say, we want nothing to do with you. You're bitter. Get out of here. And Mm -hmm. I do understand both sides because I understand the industry. They're worried about the stigma that's being forced on them. And I think that is something that these people need to consider But then I also do understand these people trying to share their stories. But as far as Mia Khalifa, you know, I thought she was dope. Like, I had invited her to some of my DJ shows when she was living in Austin. I was like, oh, like, we should, like, hang out. You know, she was, like, really funny. She had this big personality. And I thought, you know, I – and people were hating on her from the beginning because she got all this fame really quickly and mainstream fame. And people are resentful of that because it's – denied for a lot of sex workers right so she always kind of was hated on from the beginning and and same thing that happened with bell knox where i see that happening to someone i always want to reach out and be like hey like i'm your friend in the industry because i understand like you're going through the stigma of being a sex worker but then also the other sex workers like don't fuck with you (laughs) that's like a very hard place to be um so i always like made the effort to like go to those people and be like hey like i'm cool with you you know whatever And, you know, so I thought she was cool and I had made that effort. And so then to see her come out with this story later, it was like, I don't know. It's just like you didn't think for a second of how this could affect everyone else in the industry, you know. And I just don't like that she's pushing this whole story that she's like a champion of sex workers. But yet she won't listen to any of them. She won't talk to any of them. Like, the only people that she'll talk to are people who agree with her. And Mm -hmm. the thing is, is if you're really going to be a champion for someone, then you need to listen to all of their opinions. You need to understand all the experiences. And that is not what she's doing. You know, it's just like, this is bad because what happened to me was bad. And she says she's sex sex work positive, but, like, I don't see that. Like, you can say that. But when you're only sharing negative experiences, you're not like saying, hey, this girl's fucking awesome and she has a great career in the industry and has had an amazing time. Like, go check out her OnlyFans, you know, kind of thing, like where you're putting a pos- shining a positive light on it as well. And if all you're doing is saying, my experience was bad, this company is bad, this industry is bad, it's exploitive, that's all you're pushing, you know? And I, yeah. I just, there's push- nothing. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, there's nothing like, constructive in her criticism. It's not like a, Hey, I had a bad experience. These are the mistakes that I made. These are the people that I work with that I shouldn't have worked with. Like, here's what other girls should avoid, Mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, um, you know, being like every, it's all bad. Everything's bad. It's all exploitative. Um, my experience speaks for everybody's experience in the adult industry. Well, and, you know, as far as that constructive criticism and, like, looking back on how you could have done things differently, I think that something I'm, like, kind of nervous to talk about because people are very sensitive, but, you know, I do kind of – I think that's important that, you know, if sex work is a regular job and it's normal, then, like, you need to approach that like you would any other job. And, like, you can always do things better. And there's kind of this idea that I've seen kind of being floated around and pushed that, like, you know, we're like constantly victims and like even some like sex workers who are sex worker positive and like love their careers are kind of pushing this of like, you know, they need to be babied and basically, you know, you can 
like they don't want to look back and think, well, maybe I could have communicated better or I could have done something differently. And that's tough because, you know, people think, oh, it's sex. Like you are just a victim. If anything bad happens to you during sex, you're just a victim. And just because you're a victim doesn't mean there's not things to learn from it, you know? Um, I mean, I think of things like, and maybe I'm just kind of a person who I've had bad things happen to me, but a lot of times I don't think it was my fault because I put myself in that situation. You know, I don't think, oh, it's me. I'm a bad person. No, the person who did it is the bad person. They did the bad thing, but I can look back and be like, okay, what did I learn from this experience and how can I avoid these types of people and this kind of interactions in the future? And unfortunately, like I, I know like Kate Kennedy kind of posted this thing about, you know, here's how you can like avoid being sexually assaulted. And people got really mad at her. Uh, like yeah, they said told her that she like was vic- victim blaming. Victim blaming. And I know that that's not what she was doing at all because at the end of the day, like if someone's going to hurt you and do something against your will, like they're going to do it anyway. And there's nothing really you can do to stop that. And so it's not that if anything happens to you, you shouldn't have dressed that way or you shouldn't have gone there alone. Like, no, 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 no. Like ultimately they are the bad guy. They did the bad thing. But that doesn't mean that there's not things that you can learn to because predators and bad people exist in every all over the place. I mean, I think like some of the worst things I experienced was from an ex-boyfriend that I dated while I was in porn. And, you know, he is just super he's slut shamey, just like some of the worst like trauma that I have sexually is like from this person. And that Mm -hmm. wasn't even in the industry, you know? So predators, manipulators, sociopaths, narcissists, all these people that will take advantage of you and cause you trauma, they can come up at any point in your life. You don't just do sex work and that's how you come across them. It could be your boyfriend. It could be your boss at fucking Dunkin' Donuts. Like it doesn't matter. Like, and so looking and saying, how can I identify these kinds of behaviors, avoid it, And also learn how to handle myself when I am in one of these situations is a really positive thing. It doesn't mean that if something still happens, that it's your fault. You know, that's not what it means at all. Like, you are not to blame ever. It's not you should have done this. But, like, maybe you could have done this and it would have caused you less trauma because of it. And I don't think that's a negative thing to say. And I was mind blown by the hate she was getting because I know it came from such a good place. And... I I always try to tell girls that stuff like here, like these people are shitty, avoid them, like, you know, kind of thing. And yes, it would be amazing if one day we just poof, every predator is out of the industry and we don't have any of that. But I mean, it doesn't happen in politics in any other industry. Why would the adult industry suddenly be free from the stuff that every other industry is still experiencing, you know? Yeah. I think people are so touchy on it because, you know, it's about, it's, it's, it's about sex, which is some, a subject that a lot of us are still very uncomfortable with. Mm-hmm. And I think also too, there is a bit of like ethical murkiness in the industry. Mm-hmm. And so I think people have a hard time like wading through that, you know, and it's, and it's like, you can't go into the adult industry believing that it's all bad or it's all good. Mm-hmm. It's both. Right. So what I think what you're saying with Kate is Kate was trying to arm people with information right. that might help them navigate an Through industry that and is good and bad. Right. And uh, I do believe that people read that wrong. But yes. people read everything wrong on Twitter anyways, yes. you know? <laughs> Very something much about so. like that social media platform that's that's toneless and you're just reading 135 characters or however many characters. Like 128 now or something. I don't know. Yeah, anyway. I think they moved it up to like they, two. Yeah. Years so, <laughs> um, so there's a lot, and it's so you know, and and it's like you read things in whatever mindset you're in, right? And because you're not actually having like person to person discourse with someone, you can totally read it the wrong way, and then that other person isn't there to say, no, 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 that's not what I meant at all. Right. I meant it this way. It's so like. Twitter just doesn't allow for the usual one-on-one conversations that I think help us move dialogue forward and address issues in a responsible and adult way. It's just like people just screaming at each other. Yeah, no, very much so. And that's like where actually with the Mia Khalifa thing, you know, 
I was trying to not say anything. Just don't get involved, you know? (laughs) And then, then of course, I just can't. I'm just like, that's not my personality. Like, I see something, someone doing something that I think is wrong, and I I have to say something. I've been that way Mm -hmm. since I was four years old, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, so I had written, I thought, a lot of really kind of thoughtful tweets to her. And in that day that she was kind of going off and I had probably tagged her and like actually like tweeted at her probably like four or five really well thought out tweets that were directed to her. And of course, like she ignores all of those. Um, And, I, you know, it's not like, oh, you didn't see my tweets because I had basically I saw in her her fans were responding and I saw someone being like, oh, wow, this just shows how terrible the industry is, you know. And I responded to him and specifically untagged her and said, hey, like, you know, please stop stigmatizing an entire industry based off one person's perspective. So she wasn't tagged in this tweet. It wouldn't come up in her mentions. It was just to one of her fans that I felt like was taking too much from one, something she said. And that's the tweet that she chose to basically respond to and quote retweet and put on her page ignore all the very thoughtful things I had said that were directed at her because if she posts those on her page, that might actually get someone else to not agree with her. Right. Yeah. It takes you know? the wind out of her argument. Right. So let me take this two little, this one little sentence that she wrote to someone else and put that on blast where people don't know any of the context and then they can judge from there. And so when she did that, I was like, "Mm, I see where this is going. Like, you only respond to the most inflammatory messages. Like, if a girl is like, says something mean, you post that and go, you know, oh, look how jealous everyone in the industry is of me, you know? Mm -hmm. But when someone says, hey, no judgment, but like, here's some ideas of things that are important, you just conveniently don't see that. And, um, you know, I was like, okay, I'm not getting involved in this. Like, I'm not going to do that. So that's why I wrote a blog. I wrote her a letter. And because I thought in, in a Twitter, in a tweet, I can only say a sentence and so many things can get misconstrued. If I write a blog, I can really get all my thoughts out so you can really understand. So if you want to, if you really want to understand why people in the industry are upset, And you really want to understand how you can continue to share your truth and your story and fight for yourself without stigmatizing sex workers. Here are resources and here, here, here it is. And, you know, I I did that and I, I woke up in the morning. I had shit to do later that day. So I sat down and I spent my whole fucking morning writing this blog and put a lot of like heart and soul into it tweeted it back at her to her response. I was like, you know, I really can't respond on a tweet. So I hope you choose to read this. Radio silence. And, you know, that's just like, to me, if, you know, it was such, I I really tried to approach it with such an empathetic, understanding tone too. You know, I don't, I know people really do attack her and I'm like, this obviously isn't helping. You know, I, I'm saying your truth is valid. That's fine. But here are some other things to consider, you know? And the fact that you're not interested in having a discourse about that just to me proves that you have no interest in serving anyone but yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and then, I mean, of course, like the bang bro stuff came out shortly after that of them calling her out. And I have no reference of, you know, if that, any of that was true. Um, I don't know. Did you see the website that they made? Yeah, I saw that they said stuff like, you know, she claimed she only made twelve thousand dollars. That she said she made like a hundred and seventy eight thousand. I'm a little bit confused on what that meant. Was she getting residuals from her website? I think, like, I think they paid sure. her to basically promote them on social media and okay. be, run their social media stuff and basically promote them on social media um, after she was like shooting. So that was what my understanding of that. But um, and then That's the fact a lot. that. Of money to pay somebody to do right. it. Be yeah. Other stuff too. Yeah. She said, well, she said it in an interview that she was on their payroll, like not as a performer, but like, you know, she was okay. doing other okay. things for them, which I think included social media. I mean, okay. she had a huge following at that point. I'm sure they were like, yes, keep promoting us. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. And then basically that, you know, she said that Bang Bros had gotten manipulated her into the industry 
And that, and, but basically she had shot for a few companies before Bang Bros. Um, so again, I don't have any knowledge of whether if the, any of this is true. I was very curious to see her response. I was very open-minded to her saying, none of this is true and here's the proof. But she didn't respond, which again, to me is like, okay, why, if this was not true, you would clearly just say it's not true. But the fact that you don't respond, just like you didn't respond to my blog post, because it requires you to actually question some of the things you're saying and maybe modify your behavior, you ignore it, you know? And I just don't think that that's anyone who's open-minded and really wanting to do the right thing is, isn't going to ignore something like that. You know, like, I, I mean, someone wrote, like, I wrote a whole, and it's like, you know who I am. Like, you, you responded to my tweet. I sat down and spent my entire morning writing you a letter because I really want this to be beneficial for everyone. I want you to tell your story, but I don't want sex workers to be harmed in the process of that. And that's all my intention was. And the fact that you have no care for that um, is, is just, it's really unfortunate. And you know, I, I try not to judge. I don't know the whole story and I I never want to, you know, hate on anyone that I really don't know, but it does just make me sad to see these girls and they just get the mainstream press loves it. You know, they eat mm-hmm. it up. It's just mm-hmm. I always just think I'm like I wonder if I was just like, you know, I was so abused in porn, like would I suddenly be a huge mainstream success? You yeah. know, because I've always stayed with this really positive view of it. And it's just, like, unfortunate to see, like, the minute you start talking about how you were a victim. And a huge problem I have with that, too, is that, you know, she was out of college and 20, 21, 22, so around the same age as me. So we were both college-educated 21, 22-year-olds when we got into porn. So we have similar experiences, right? And it's just wild to me because I know what my mindset was. And I know she's an intelligent person and trying to push this whole narrative that you were somehow manipulated. I mean, at that point, when is someone old enough or mature enough or educated enough to ever have sex with anyone? You know, if at 22 with a college degree, you're unable to make decisions for yourself and anything that happens is you being manipulated when you chose to go do this, it's just, I don't know. I feel like that's leading to this whole, and like you were saying earlier, people are still very uncomfortable with sex and it really leads to this very negative view on sex that it's always exploitive, that women are always victims. And at the end of the day, like sex is just sex. You know, it's just this thing that we literally do to procreate. We do for enjoyment. It's, it's not exploitive. It's not doesn't have to be violent. And this kind of thought process of that, you know, you doing porn, you were somehow manipulated into it. What do you mean you were manipulated? You had a college degree. You're a grown ass adult. If we say that a 22 year old with a college degree isn't, you know, a mature enough to decide to do sex work, then who is, you know? Yeah. And that just leads to the whole thing that no one should ever do sex work because it will always be exploitive, you know? And I just, I would be a lot more understanding if, you know, I know girls who got into the business at 18, they had no money, they've been caring for their family members since they were in their teen, you know, 16. And, you know, there's a lot of pressure for them to make money, to care for their family. There are a lot of people who get into porn for those reasons. And I would be a lot more understanding, but just seeing someone kind of come from privilege from education, being a full grown adult saying I was taken advantage of. It's like, I mean, at what point did you learn to be an adult? Because I would think at 22, you would be old enough, you know? Ah. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So everything that you said kind of leads me to this thought that I've had more and more frequently as of late. And it's really how problems with sex work revolves more around the stigma that you face from doing Mm -hmm. it rather than the sex work itself. And if, and, and you said yourself just now, you know, like, what if I came out and, you know, spoke against the adult industry? Like, would that help my career? Cause I know you're trying to transition to something else. And I wonder if society 
enjoys or kind of demands this almost like baptism where mm-hmm. you come mm-hmm. out of sex work and you go into like mains and in order for them to accept you into the mainstream industry, you have to like renounce your sins, like having been in porn and say that you regret it and it was sinful and it was wrong. And I'm so sorry. And I was victimized and I didn't know any better and can you please forgive me? And can I now like do something else with my life? Oh, people love that shit. Right. Because <laughs> cause you're right. The media does eat that up. They love that stuff because it, you know, pushes the narrative that, you know, everybody is comfortable with, right? Mm-hmm. People are very uncomfortable with the idea of sex being anything more than, you know, something dirty. That, that's dirty, especially For if dirty. there's money involved. Yeah. You know, or it should only be between a man and a woman who like are married and love each other. The idea that sex could be something else besides those things, I think a lot of people are really resistant to. Mm-hmm. So these kinds of stories, like Mia, that that play into their um, into their biases, is, is is something that they they want to hear. You know, because we always we all want to hear that our beliefs are right. right. We always want to hear that what we think is the right thing. You know, confirmation we never, bias. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Confirmation bias. We never want to like challenge our own ideas. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. So, so, so that whole story kind of made me think about that. Like, is it more difficult for someone to go the route that like Jesse Andrews did, or Sasha Gray, or Sonny Leone, and not? you know, bash porn, but be like, I had a good experience. It was fine. And now I've moved on and I want something else. I wonder, you know, um, if, if they fake, I mean, actually I don't wonder, I fucking interviewed Sasha about this and we talked yeah. about this. Um, and she, her transition didn't seem to be as difficult as one might imagine. She, I think she was a, she was a special case. She had yeah. like a, she had a timing thing and like, there was a yeah. lot of like things lined up really well for her I think I've like studied a lot of these people's careers because I was like (laughs) how can I like emulate this so I think a lot of it comes with like timing of like what's going on in the world and how you know Sasha was kind of like this like she was people weren't used to seeing someone like that you know Mm -hmm. and I think it was coming to a point where more people were becoming more comfortable with porn and and she was like very different, you know, she didn't look like a porn star. She was super intellectual, you know, she's like a smart girl and has all these other interests and stuff. And so I think it was like, oh, wow, you're like this outlier. But, you know, now there's like a million Sasha Grays in porn, you know, yeah. girls who are crazy dirty on camera, but like super intellectual and and into other things off camera. But I think she was kind of like that first person to really like make, uh, right. you know, to be able to capitalize on that. But as far as what you said about the whole like kind of baptism thing it's funny because I was even aware of this before I got into porn uh you know when I I told my parents I was going to do porn and because my first agent in the business was like you need to tell your family because they're going to find out and like just deal with it yourself instead of having someone else tell them and you know so I told my parents and I remember saying like you know well if I regret this I can literally just say well I'm a born-again Christian and this was terrible and everyone will forgive me. And it's true because the minute and, and not that I would ever do that. I'm such an atheist. But like, you know, it just that this I knew before I ever got into porn that that avenue existed. Right. Mm. That you can say it was all a big mistake. You know, I did. I was sinful. But now I love Jesus and he has forgiven me. And people are like, Yes come to Mm -hmm. the light. You know, they love it. They'll forgive you for all that shit. So I knew that that was something people did and that that was an option, like before I'd even experienced the stigma of porn, you know, so it's, it's very, very common. And I honestly can't hate on people for wanting to take advantage of it. You know, it's, it's not like what I would do. I think I'm like a very real person and I'm not very good at, you know, I always say how I feel, um, very honest. But I do, so I don't think that would be an easy thing for me, but I do understand why it's tempting to people. Um, And especially too, I think a lot of times they really do believe it because- I was just going to say that. (laughs) Absolutely, they believe it because everybody around them tells them that. Yeah. There are people around them telling them like, it's okay. It's not your fault. You know, this was a bad thing you did. Like Jesus still loves you or like whatever it is. 
And it's just easy to think, yeah, like all this could go away, like all the stigma, like all these problems with my relationships, all these problems with my family, like it will all be forgiven if I just say, you know, that it was a mistake. And it's unfortunate because like it turns into this, the industry was bad, but like, and I even pointed this out to Mia actually in one of her tweets, she said she made a list of 10 things that she'd experienced because of porn, right? And um, when I look at this list, I see 10 things you've experienced because of society's stigma against sex workers, Mm, you know? Yeah. Like your family disowning you has nothing to do with the industry. It really doesn't. No one in the industry called up your family and said, your daughter's a whore, disown her. You know, like that didn't happen. Like your family obviously feels some type of way about sex work and wants nothing to do with you because of that. Your boyfriend who can't handle the fact that you did porn, that causes problems in your relationships, that has nothing to do with the industry. That has to do with people's stigma of porn. Death threats for having done porn. Again, nothing to do with the industry. It has only to do with the stigma. And so I like that's what I was trying to point out to her and to many other people, you know, that nine times out of 10, the things that you're experiencing negative because of sex work are due to the stigma. And it has nothing to do with your actual experience. And not saying that your whole experience had to be perfect. I mean, I had, you know, shitty experiences in porn. I had like directors take advantage of me. I had things happen. But, you know, I'm able to understand that that was this person, that company, this experience, not the entire thing of sex work, because I also have these positive experiences. But you just want to say, oh, all these bad things I'm experiencing are direct result of the industry when most of them aren't. And I really do empathize with it because there was a time period um, I was going through some shitty stuff in the business and I was still, you know, trying to transition to into DJing, but I was still shooting. And I really did have this kind of um, resentment for a while towards porn um, because I was constantly, you know, I was trying to prove myself I could do other things. And that was being constantly questioned because of porn stigma. But at the same time, I was experiencing a really bad situation that I'm not allowed to talk about (laughs) in the the porn industry. (laughs) So I wasn't allowed to, you know, so I was going through that. And so I was having this really negative experience in the business. And then I was having this really negative experience of stigma of being a porn star. And I I started to hate the industry, you know, like Mm -hmm. I was like, I, I, and so I do empathize so deeply with these girls because I was there, but I also was aware enough to say like, okay, this is not you. You know, this is not like you're feeling this type of way because of these things that are happening. And once I was able to get out of that situation and somewhat resolve that, um, you know, suddenly it was like, okay, this is huge weight lifted off my shoulders. So, and then suddenly I was able to look positively on the industry again. But I do understand that if you had a bad experience in porn, and you deal with the stigma, those things, basically you add them together and you're like, these are the same, but they're not Mm -hmm. like, this was one person that like did something bad to you or one experience. And this is the stigma of society. So what's the really, the really harmful thing is the stigma and not saying that bad things can't happen to you in porn, but the industry itself isn't like some evil, like, overlord like hey, anyone who comes here we will take advantage of them out your soul. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly like that's not what's happening like it doesn't mean you can't have bad experiences but really what these people and i've seen this with almost every single girl and a lot of them it's sadly and i can speak from experience for this too is in relationships you know um you know i think a lot of girls like you get into porn it's very exciting like okay suddenly you know like for me i had always been this tomboy you know, kind of one of the guys like talking shit, you know, and now suddenly I'm like the hot girl, you know, that like everyone's like, and I was like, oh, this is so cool. And that's really fun for a while. And then eventually you're like, maybe you meet someone that you really like and you want to date them. And now you suddenly have to deal with all the things that come along with dating and doing pornography, which is a lot. And I think even some of the most highly evolved men, it just, it doesn't matter. Like, I mean, I dated a guy who was in the industry and there was even jealousy between us and we were both doing the same job. So, 
you know, I don't think just because a guy's jealous or doesn't love it, I don't think that he's a bad person because of that. I, it is a difficult thing to deal with because of society. But I see so many girls that basically they're shamed by their boyfriend. And I mean, it could be their family or anything else. But I think for a lot of girls I've seen, it has been a significant other that's basically shamed them for their job. And it makes them, you know, you feel like you want love. And when that mm -hmm. love is being denied you because of your past and because of this job that you did, it's very easy to just want to reject it so that you can get that love, you know? And it's just really sad how many times, like, boyfriends, like, do that to girls in the industry, you know, basically shame them. And I mean, my ex-boyfriend was like that. He, you know, would break up with me when I was on set, like, crazy. Like, I'm like, I'm at work. And he's just like, oh, my God, I can't deal with the fact that you're on set. Like, we need to break up. You know, I'm like, what the fuck, you know? And I was just, like, constantly shaming me for having done porn. And the best learning experience for me was getting out of that relationship, finding out that this guy had been married the entire time. Oh we were in God. a serious relationship. Serious relationship. And he was married. He and his, uh, me and his ex-wife have since chatted, and we have basically figured out how everything went down. And, um, you know, so he was doing this stuff to her as well. And, you know, the whole time, every day, he had a wife. He was fucking God knows who, how many other girls. You know, he was doing literally whatever he wanted. And but every day shaming me for doing a job that he knew I was doing when we met. Right. And that was a really good learning experience for me because I was like, I'm never going to let someone do this to me again. I will never let anyone make me feel guilty about what I've done because I know I feel good about it. And anyone who's trying to shame me is projecting their own shame that they have about the things they've done onto mm -hmm. me. And I think right. I was very lucky in that, in that, I mean, it was a bad experience, but I came out of it stronger where I was like, I will never let anyone shame me for this again, because it had been proven that this person who was shaming me was projecting it, you know, but not everyone yeah. has that learning experience. Yeah. So you have moved on. Well, I know you don't want to say you've officially retired, but for mm -hmm. now you're not shooting right now. And you've really been doing a lot of DJing and I've listened to some of your music. I've watched you do some of your sets and you're, you're honestly, you're very good. Okay. I'm no expert on EDM or anything like that. <laughs> I assume is what you do. I'm sorry. I'm so old. I don't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just assume all DJs is DJ. EDM, but you can correct me. <laughs> um, I think Sasha had to do the same thing with me because I was like, you make that electronic. Yeah. <laughs> but your stuff is great. So tell us a little bit about how you got into that and exactly what kind of music you do and maybe where people can find your music. Uh, well, you know, I actually like was doing music since I was a little kid. I grew up doing musical theater. Me and my best friend had like a little band and like since middle school and we would write songs and stuff. So I've always been like very involved in music. Um, but I think it was like in college when I first in, in the South, like where I went to college, EDM was like not a thing, you know, uh, no one listened to it. I mean, it was kind of getting its start in all of America, but definitely in the South, like no one was listening to that. And mm -hmm. I had a few friends from, like, New Jersey, New York, and I went to one of their parties, and they played, like, a Skrillex song, and I it was, like, when dubstep was getting big, and I was just, like, what the fuck is this? Like, I love it. It's awesome. Like, I want to listen to this all the time. I want to just spend my life going to shows. Um, so I got really into it, into college, and it's funny, actually, my nickname in college was DJ long before I ever actually was a DJ because uh, I just like was super into like finding all these cool like remixes and songs and I love to go to parties and be like oh I gotta show you guys this new song like like trap music is something that I still love to this day and like when trap was first starting to get big I mean before it had gotten big you know when it was kind of in its infancy I remember right. like going to parties and telling people like oh like trap music like this is the next wave it's gonna be so big you know and so I was like really into this stuff and going to festivals and all that was just like this crazy new experience for me. I was like a 20, 21 year old. 
Um, and then I had a neighbor in college who was a producer and DJ. And so my friend knew him and she introduced me and she's like, oh my God, like you have to teach her how to DJ. So I would literally go to this guy's house and he would just like teach me like some production stuff, some DJing. And it was like on the shittiest like little mixer, like back in like, I don't know, 2012 or something, 2011, 2010 maybe. And um, just kind of like learn from him. And uh, so it was just kind of like a fun hobby that I like to do. Um, but, you know, I didn't necessarily see myself like doing anything professional with it. But when I got when I first started kind of that's one reason why I was interested in like Sasha Gray and Jesse Andrews because they had both done porn and then done DJing. And I was like, oh, my God, like I would love to do that, you know. So I kind of like, was like I think I can use this as like a way to get into music. So that's kind of like porn was always kind of like a stepping stone for me. I mean, like it was its own like individual amazing experience. But, you know, it was always kind of like with the thought process that I would get into the music industry afterward. And one reason like the EDM community is very open minded to sex workers. You know, it's uh, the mainstream side of it, super, super mainstream, maybe not so much. But I think that like, I don't know, so many DJs like, date porn girls and you know there's just like a lot of crossover as far as like the social side of it of people hanging out and so because of that it's just a very like if I go into a a certain industries they'd be like what are you doing here like you're a porn star like they've never you know but in the in the electronic like dance community like they're used to like they all everyone has a porn star friend they all you know so it's just a lot less like you're weird and out there and you're a lot more easily accepted. Um, so I think that's one reason probably why a lot of people kind of transition from porn into that because it's just an industry that's very accepting. Um, but yeah, I just started like just DJing at first. And then I kind of got to a point where I was like, I think I need to like make music to really do more. Um, and I, honestly, I'm still figuring out what the fuck kind of music I make. I don't know. If you've listened to some of my stuff, it's, like, all over the place. Like, I have an EP that's very, like, vibey. Like, I sang on it. It's, like, all these, like, breakup songs about, like, ex-boyfriends. And then I have some really, like, more hard bass-type music. Um, so I'm still kind of figuring out what I want to do. But uh, one thing I realized that I really love doing is um, open format DJing, which is, like, for clubs. You know, so you can play a festival and play all these like bangers and, you know, your own music. And that's what I thought I wanted to do. And I didn't think that like playing a club was like maybe lame, you know, it wasn't as cool. But over the years, I've learned like that. I love doing that. I can see see myself doing that till I'm like 70. You know, like I want to be like a 70 year old woman with like, my little white hair, like DJing at like fucking Hakkasan, you know, (laughs) I love that. Like, it's just so cool. And, you know, it's, it's cool to play a festival and, you know, this, it's all fancy and everything like that. But playing at clubs is really, you know, playing at a festival is more about showcasing your work, right? Here's my music and like this, I'm an artist and this is like, you're creating a show and playing a club is more about how can I get these people in this room to vibe, to move? Like you want everyone, you want people buying bottles. You want people standing on the table, singing along. You want people Mm -hmm. to go home and be like, that night was fantastic. I had the best time. And that's really your job as a DJ, as as an open format DJ. And I've found that I really, really love that. And I think it's really where my talent lies, you know? Um, although I do like to make music, I don't think I'm like a savant or like anything. Like mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm gonna like make the next like classic song people are li- listening to 50 years from now. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's really my vibe, but I I love to basically connect with people and help everyone have like an awesome time. You know, awesome. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> and where can people find? Where can people go and like find your music? Um, Spotify, Carta Cruz, SoundCloud, most everything's on Spotify, but I have some remixes and stuff that are on SoundCloud. Oh, my Audius, Audius Audius.co is a new app and all my mixes are up there that got taken down off other places. Um, 
So I have all my mixes and remixes up there. You can pretty much find everything on my audios. So I would definitely direct you there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Carter, for coming on. This was a really, uh, this is a really cool conversation. And I loved everything that you said about the stigma around porn and about people's experiences and learning from your experiences. I thought it was like a really mature way to look at all of that. And, um, you know, that there's something to be said to, you know, acknowledge that people are definitely victims of certain situations. There's a difference between like having been a victim of being in a situation and then falling into victim mode and constantly playing victim forever and not like that's never going to move you forward. Right. You know, um, there's a lot, there's power in taking responsibility for your actions mm-hmm. and the things that happen in your life. A hundred percent. And I think that that's, I think as women, we benefit from that. I think so. we do. And I think people respect it. I will say like, I think, you know, whenever I see these girls kind of playing the victim mode, cause it does, it gets the mainstream press, they eat it up. But I'm always like, I think most people like, they people think it's so cool when you're just like yeah i did porn and like whatever it's not a big deal yeah people really fuck with that and like i i think there is value in that and i think people really do respect that a lot more than you think you know yeah 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 um all right well thank you again for coming on it was a pleasure can you tell everybody where they can find you online like which camera do I look at this one is <laughs> um you can um you can find me literally everywhere uh, as Carter Cruz Carter like the president Cruz like cruise ship but Carter like the president doesn't really work anymore because Jimmy Carter was so long ago. yeah nobody remembers who Jimmy Carter is anymore I know I feel like seven years ago it was like everyone's like okay I know what you're referencing but now everyone's like what <laughs> Um, cruise like cruise ship though. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, um, freaking, I have a website, cruisecult.com. I got blogs up there with all my dumbass thoughts and all my music and merch, cool ass t-shirts. I just released some new ones. So yeah, just Carter Cruise on everything pretty much. Fantastic. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. And as always support this podcast through patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered, where you can get early access to all of my interviews, plus merch, plus my bonus uh, podcast, my LA porn life and tons of other stuff. Also, if you want to support my art book, um, you can go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall art. I recently just started shooting for it again. I've actually started shooting on film, which has been really fun. So go check that out. And um, thank you so much for listening. Tommy, sit your fucking ass down. With your- <laughs> I swear to God, I'm going to kill this dog. Sit. 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 I feel like people love this stuff, though, because it's, like, very, like, real. You know? It's, like, it's oh, like, your dog's, real. like, in your way and shit. It's, it's like, like, fucking <laughs> tap it into the background. Like, and I know it's picking up on the sound. It makes me nuts. There's, all, like, anal about, you know, like, perfect quality, but it's so hard to do at home. Anyways, I'm sorry, guys. I got dogs. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us, and 